and welcome to episode 6 of LUFC Fan Zone Podcast. I'm Sam Isles. And I'm Jack Ellis. In each episode, we'll be talking to a next Leeds United player or manager about their time at the club. Our guests are chosen by you, our followers and listeners, who get the chance to choose who we are joined with by voting in a poll on our LUFC Fan Zone Instagram story. We're delighted to announce that today's episode is sponsored by a luxury watch brand and the official timing partner of Leeds United, Louis Erard. The company was founded in 1931 in Switzerland, and they have been an official partner with Leeds for the last four years. As this season is Leeds United's centenary year, Louis Erard have created this limited edition watch to celebrate 100 years of Leeds United. This celebratory watch is limited to just 100 pieces, with every piece made precisely by hand. The watch uses the same automatic chronograph found in brands such as Tag Heuer, Breitling, and their limited edition centenary piece has a special dial made using fragments of the brick from the players' tunnel at Ellen Road, allowing you to wear a very unique piece of Leeds United history on your wrist. The watch is available on the official Leeds United website and the online club shop, as well as on Louis Arad's Instagram page, at Louis Arad Official, and their website, www.louisarad.com, along with the rest of their luxury watches. But back to the show. And this week's poll showed that almost three quarters of you wanted a former player who won Player of the Year at Leeds United rather than someone who won Leeds' as Goal of the Season award. All of our episodes can be found on our LUFC fans on YouTube channel, as well as Spotify and Apple Podcast. On last episode, we were with former midfielder Olivier Decor and spoke to him about the pressure he was under at Leeds after he was signed for a club record 7.2 million in the year 2000, as well as Leeds' Champions League run and his debut season at the club. This week, we were with a former centre half who became a fan's favourite during his time at Leeds and someone who played a vital part in the club's automatic promotion from League One in 2010. That's right. This week we're delighted to be joined by former defender Patrick Isnobo. Thank you so much for joining us, Paddy. Thank you, guys. I know we're obviously planning to talk to you about your time at Leeds United, but at the right. moment, Leeds, obviously, as you might know, are in the automatic promotion places in the Championship. Yep. And have a great yeah. chance of returning to the Premier League for the first time in 16 yeah. years. Yeah. Do you still follow Leeds at all, the matches' results? And if so, do you think this will be finally the year that we do get promoted? Yeah, well, the, on the answer to the first question is, obviously, I still, you know, check out for Leeds results. Um, sometimes I don't, get, I don't get to watch the games um, as much due to, obviously, the, the time difference. But I'm always, you know, checking out, the, you know, what they did in, in, the, in the games that they've played on the weekend. Um, I think it's the year that they will get promoted. Um, I think they're too far ahead of uh, of third. Um, so look, they've, they've they've given themselves a great chance to get promoted. And, and I think the Premier League um, have you know waken up a sleeping giant due to you know obviously Leeds haven't been promoted in 16 years. So you know I think the biggest team in England um, with the biggest fans and the best fans in England. Um, will turn, return to the Premier League this year. Like we said earlier, the focal point, obviously, for journey's podcast is going to be talking about Leeds, but it'd be great if we could start from the beginning of your career, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah so your, per, your first professional club was your local side, South Melbourne, who at the yeah. time played in the National Soccer League, which was the yeah. equivalent of the Australian A-League today, which is obviously yeah. the top of Australian football. Yeah. However, in 2003, which was your third professional season as a player, the league folded and professional football in Australia stopped. Yeah. What led to the demise of the Australian National League and what impact did it have on you during your playing career? Well, I think I left at a, at a crucial time where I think um, I think I left a year before it, it actually like finished. So I was probably um, one of the lucky ones that, uh, that escaped that. So... I think with me sort of growing up in the way we did, especially here, um, you know, back in those days, you know, the, the Australian league was very was very difficult, but it created a, a lot of good players, as you would know, that have come to Leeds and all around the world. So I was very fortunate to grow up in that era before it, it ended. Um, so it was sort of like the catalyst to my career. Um, you know, for people that don't know, you know, it's very difficult in a country where you know football is not your number one sport, especially around the, the Australia here. So, for us Australians, you know, to do what we love most and to play football um, in a in a country where it's probably the sixth sport 
um, in the in the land, it's very difficult. So I was very fortunate enough to leave at a point where um, the league was sort of decreasing, um, but it was sort of my next step into you know, professional football where obviously I went to Scotland. Yeah, I was going to follow on to that because obviously Scotland is a long way away from Australia and it's quite a big difference from Melbourne. So, yep. so what made you switch to Scotland? And so the, the, there was there was um, two options. Um, I could have gone to Scotland or Italy and I played against the... Uh, a guy, Dave McPherson, who used to play um, in, at a club here called Carlton. Um, and obviously, he, he's a big player, you know, at Rangers and Hearts. And, you know, uh, my agent at the time had a very good uh, sort of relationship with him and uh, said that, you know, would you be interested in bringing myself uh, to, to England, oh, sorry, to England, to Scotland for um, a, a couple of trials, um, which I did. Uh, I went to four trials. Uh, within sort of two and a half weeks. Um, and I ended up at Hearts, where after, you know, trialling for two days, um, I, I received a, an offer for a, a professional contract. So, um, again, I was very fortunate um, at the time to, to be put in that position. But again, it's a, it's a, it's pretty hard for a, a nice kid to go on his own um, to a country that he's never been to um, to, p- pursue his, uh, to pursue his dream. And from Scotland, you made his switch to Leicester City, where you played yeah. over 100 times for the club. How did he find you four years there? Yeah, look, uh, again, it was great because, you know, um, Craig Levine was my gaffer at Hearts and he brought me to Leicester, um, where I spent, you know, a lot, a lot of time there. Again, it, it, it was a good club. Um, it was good, a good introduction into into English football. Um, and again, you know, look, again... It, sometimes you sometimes you got to find your feet and that's probably you know at the start where I had to do it um but again um going towards that you know I had I had a great time there in 2009 you were released by Leicester uh, after promotion to the championship would you have liked to stay at Leicester longer perhaps look at that time it was difficult because you know the club was going through a lot you know when I arrived there we were in the championship um and then obviously, you know, we got relegated, I think, three years later. And then we went back up, you know, sort of in the, in the following year. Um, look, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, people are comfortable where they are. And I thought maybe at that stage I was. But in my heart, um, I knew it was time and it was time for me to, to leave. Um, even though Leicester was a great place and the people there treated me really well. But I knew in my heart it was, uh, you know, I think it was the right time to leave, you know, to pursue something else. Yeah. And two months after leaving Leicester, you ended up joining Leeds on a free transfer at the start of the 2009-2010 yeah. season. When yeah. did you first know about Leeds' interest and what did you know about the club before you joined? Um, well, to be fair, I, I, I was called pretty much within two days uh, as soon as um, I left Leicester. Um before Leeds, I, I was going to sign at Derby County, um, which is obviously was close to Leicester. Mm. But when once I, you know I went for a tour uh, to Leicester, spoke to Simon Grayson, um, I, I knew it was the club that I wanted to be at. You know, with us, with us Australians, obviously, you know, you, you, you Harry Kules and your Mark Vadukas, you know, really put Leeds United on the map. Um, so we knew. A lot of Australians knew, and myself knew a lot about Leeds. Um, and as soon as sort of the option came up, even though I didn't decide it straight away, um, in the back of my mind, I sort of knew that I wanted to end up there some way or somehow. Um, and I did. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know, but when I was, I think I was 15, 16, I was supposed to sign at Leeds. Um, but my club in Leeds United couldn't agree a... Um, uh, a fee for me because they thought I'd be it was too much, so I, maybe I could have my future would have would have been a bit uh, different because I could have ended up at Leeds uh, as a young kid. It didn't happen, um, so I call it fate that I ended up you know there eventually. When you left Leicester, you were quoted as saying that you were desperate to stay in the Championship after their promotion. However, yeah. obviously, when you joined Leeds, the side were in League One. What yeah. made you decide to join? and make the slip down into League One when you'd previously stated that you wanted to play at a higher level? 
I, I think it was, uh, um, you know, I think like obviously went, one, once I went there and, you know, I spoke to the guy for Simon Grace and, you know, and, and you see what he was trying to do. It was, it was very easy to take the steps sort of down to sort of go back up. And I knew, you know, I would be an important role in that, which was great. Um, and I knew that it was a challenge that, you know, I wanted to be part of a challenge where, you know, if we could succeed in what he wanted to do, then, you know, it, it'd be, it, it'd be great. Um, and, and that's what we did. So it was, it was an exciting sort of challenge to take, take on, even though I went a step down, but you know, like, I'm sure you've heard this before, you know, like you're, uh, it's a, it's a premiership team or club in a, in a league, in the league one. So even though the, you know, we were in two divisions down um, from sort of the premiership and a division down from the championship, you know, in the day, it's a Premier League club. Um, it just needed, you know, a, a team to get promoted and promoted again, you know, to get to where it is, you know, and obviously hopefully that happens this year. The season that you joined Leeds was the club's third, third season in League One after falling out of the championship in 2008. And the two yeah. previous seasons before you were joined, Leeds had narrowly missed out on promotion. When, yeah. when you joined and before the season had started, was manager Simon Grayson's main target to ensure that the club finally achieved promotion at the third attempt? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, um, deep down, you know, obviously he, he knew and obviously everyone knew sort of, you know, we had to get promoted, you know, in the, in that year that I came, um, even though you know, it wasn't really much spoken about in terms of, you know, we, we, you know, all the pressure that we have to, we have to, but, you know, I think he assembled the squad um, good enough to sort of get promoted in that league. And to be fair, that's what he did. Um, but day one, the day, the day that I came into the training ground, um, you, you could sense, you could sense the, obviously the disappointment and the hurt from the previous year. Um, so the, the eagerness and the hungerness to get promoted that year, you, you could tell already on the, on sort of the, the, the players' faces. And, and you could tell by, you know, sort of day one, because I remember going in there and, you know, there was a certain feel, there was a certain buzz um, sort of to the club and to the team. Whilst we're just about to begin talking to Patrick about his time at Leeds, it's a great time to promote our partner, Old School Leeds. Visit Old School Leeds on their Instagram page, at old underscore school underscore Leeds, or their website, www theoldschoolleadsco.com for all your Dirty Leeds merchandise. They have a brand new selection of Dirty Leeds shirts, jumpers, hats and even stickers. So head over to their Instagram page or website to view all their new additions. You'll need to be quick though, as their stock does run out very fast. And as a result, Old School Leeds have released a discount code FANZONE to use at checkout for 20% off your order. Check them out and help spread the Dirty Leeds name. <laughs> The first game of that campaign was against Exeter City at Ellen Road and a brace of Jermaine Beckford secured a 2-1 win. However, during that match, you sustained the head injury which resulted in your trademark head bandage and it yep. was reported that you had 12 stitches put in yep. during that match and despite mm -hmm. it occurring during the game, you returned to the pitch just minutes later. Yep. What can you remember about the incident itself, receiving the treatment and then returning to the pitch in such a short space of time? Yeah, look, all I remember was the ball was there 2-1 and I couldn't remember, I don't know the striker's name, but obviously we, we've collided heads and we've gone down. Um, and I've gone to get up and just put my hand on my head and obviously there was a gush of blood. Um, but I thought, ah, oh, blood, it's normal that, you know, I'm used to blood. But then obviously the crowd see them replay and you hear, oh, and I thought, oh, I must be in some trouble here. Um, but literally the, you know, the, the physios clean me up you know, put some um, some Vaseline on and just strap my head together to get, you know, to finish the game. That was literally it. Today, there are many laws about, like, head injuries and concussions within football and the increased safety measures reduce, like, concussion and things when returning to the pitch. Yeah. Despite the incident happening almost 11 years ago now, do you think yeah. if that was to happen today, you would have been allowed to return to the pitch? Yeah, because, look, so I, I wasn't concussed. It was just a... You know, it was just a, a nasty head injury where, you know, but my head got split open. Um, yeah, it, it was one of the, it was just one of those. Look, I, I don't know if they let me on and I, I don't know if there's a, a certain time that you need to stay off for them to check. 
Um, if it was, I'd be definitely one of those hurrying up, trying to get on the pitch as quick as I could because, you know, it, it was just it was just a little it was just a head knock. Nevertheless, the side had their best start to the season since the 1973 yeah. campaign under Don Revie, winning 17 yeah. out of their first 23 matches of the season and losing just once, putting Leeds comfortably at the top of League One in January. What do you think was the reasoning for Leeds' amazing start to that season? I think there was a, a few things. I think, number one, uh, you know, we had a belief in our squad. Um, no matter who we played against or how the how the game was going, we knew that, you know, we'll, we'll always at least have a chance to win. Um, not once did I ever feel in that time that we'll ever lose a game. So we definitely had a belief. N- num- number two, you know, sometimes, you know, again, all football teams don't play well, but Sometimes we, we weren't performing at our best. We were still picking up results. Um, I, I think that's a sign of a, of a good team um, because, uh, as we know, it's very difficult um, and we're picking up results where maybe, you know, we didn't deserve them or, you know, maybe it was sort of touch and go. But we were overcoming, you know, these little hurdles and producing results. And speaking to, you know, the players then, you know, that wasn't happening the previous year. So I think that was a, a, a definitely plus. And, and also, you know, maybe it's sort of a different squad where, you know, some quality here and there, you know, improved in the team from maybe, you know, the, the, the previous year. But the, the belief amongst the group um, was ridiculous. And again, I'll, I'll note the pre-season. I don't think we lost a, a pre-season game. We played against Blackburn, Newcastle, um, Burnley. So all these games even though they're practice games, but we still had the mentality that we wanted to win. Um, and I think that was great. Yeah. You were a regular in the side and both yourself and Leeds were playing extremely well. However, yep. you were still wearing the protective headband as a result of the earlier injury in yep. the season. Yep. And doctors believed that the injury needed plastic surgery. However, yep. you continued to battle with the head bandage rather than take yep. time out to receive the professional treatment offered and stated yep. that you had bigger things to worry about than getting your head sorted. Did you believe yep. that if you were to take up the professional treatment and you'd have to spend some time away from the team, that it would damage the form? Yeah, look, I, I just think that, you know, um, I, I wasn't prepared to do it because I just wanted to play um, and I didn't want to lose my spot. And, you know, that's it, you know, in the day, plastic surgery, plastic surgery can happen. <laughs> later in the, in the year. Um, so I played with pretty much a hole in my head the, the whole time. Um, I, I didn't really care too fair. You know, I just wanted to put the top on and get out and play the 90 minutes again and try and win. That was my, that's been my thought ever, ever like growing up. That's the way I, that's the way I am. Um, so that was sort of the way I felt when that incident happened that, you know what, bad luck, just cover it. Um, if I get hit again, I get hit again, but you know, we need to go out there and, and win th- this game. Leeds were flying in the league, and in the third round of the FA Cup, we were drawn against Manchester United at Old Trafford. And after overcoming Kettering Town in a replay, the match was confirmed, and Leeds would be visiting Old Trafford for the first time since their relegation from the Premier League in 2004. What can you remember about the build-up to that match, and was it any different to the build-up to a normal league match? Look, I think, to be fair, I was like one of those naive sort of Australians. I didn't know the actual, what it meant to, you know, um, the, the Leeds people um, and how much the, the, the they really disliked Man United. I, I didn't understand that. I thought it was just Man United, Liverpool. Um, but as I sort of got the education on Man United and Leeds, um, I quickly found out what it meant to the, the Leeds people and Leeds fans and how big this game was. Um, to be fair, I, I remember the, the lead up to the game and for me it was business as usual um but you sort of that, that realization sort of changes you know when you warm up in front of you know whatever seventy thousand, and you know they're yelling all kinds of abuse and you've heard it before every away game you travel um but it, it, it was different um so and i could tell by the the you know the plays that were you know that were northerners and born in yorkshire how much this game meant so I knew deep down how much it meant, but the lead up for me um, and the way I approached it was like uh, any other game. Prior to the official team announcement, many Leeds fans, including myself, thought that Manchester United might play a slightly weaker team because of their Premier League priority. However, 
when the teams were announced, their attack consisted of both Wayne Rooney and Dimitar yep. Berbatov. Yep. How did you find defended against them two in the match? Because at the time, they were probably two of the best attackers in the English league. Yeah, look, I think that they sort of, when you come against people like that, it's a challenge. It sort of tests you where you are in your career and as a player. And, you know, there's nothing better to get tested, you know, in those conditions away from home um, in front of 70,000 that really can't stand you. So I think, I think it was great. Um, obviously, look, they're two world-class players. Um, but I, but on that day, I think myself and, you know, the whole squad and, and, you know, obviously Richard Naylor, who was, you know, next to me, you know, I think we handled them, you know, quite well. Obviously, they are, as I said, like, renowned as being some of the best attacks at the time. So what made them so much different to the strikers that you previously faced in League One? Well, I think, you know, I think, I think the smartness of the player, you know, if you look at Wayne Rooney, you know, tactically very smart, his, his decision making is good, his movement is, you know, you, you, you can't afford to, to switch off because his movement will just, you, you're getting areas where you don't want to get into. So he, he's very smart on his runs, his movement, obviously he needs half a chance and he can score. Um, again, again with, with the team, you know, you, you give them sort of a, a, a half a yard and they can punish you because of the quality they had. Um, but it, it relates back to, you know, when we first started this our campaign for the season, and there wasn't a game that we felt that we couldn't that we couldn't win. And it was the same, you know, going into the Man United game. Um, and to be fair, I think we held our own. Obviously, as we all know, Leeds came out 1-0 winners thanks to a yep. winner from the main Beckford, which mm-hmm. not only saw Leeds win at Old Trafford for the first time in 29 years, but the result was the first time Manchester United had lost to a side outside the Premier League in the FA Cup under Sir Alex Ferguson. Did yep. you have time to celebrate or did you have to focus straight back on the league form? Look, I, I think it's I think it's normal, you know, you got to sort of enjoy that moment. Um, to be fair, uh, all I think of was after was, you know, get you warmed down because, you know, I, I think we, we, had, we had another game away. Um, so that that was that was sort of my mentality, um, but look, yeah, look, it, it, it was a great occasion, and you know, to this day, you know, sometimes when I'm bored, I put, I put the game on just to watch because sometimes you don't realise uh, what you accomplished on, on, on that day, and, and, and it was fantastic. You know, I wish I could go back and feel that feel the same way because it was a time that I'd never forget. After the Manchester game, Leeds failed to win the next three games drawing 1-1 against Wickham and then losing 2-0 against Exeter and then 3-0 against Swindon. Do you think that was because of the FA Cup match and the amount of effort that the side put in, especially how Leeds had lost just one match in the league prior to that run? Yeah, look, uh, it, it's difficult because, you know, like, you know, no one goes out there to lose. Um, and, you know, we knew what we had accomplished so far. So, you know, to keep going would have been great. Um, but unfortunately, obviously, we hit a bit of a, a, a slump. Um, and maybe, again, maybe due to the games we've played, maybe due to the Man United game um, and the emotion, the emotional uh, way it took over the team. Um, I, I, I don't know. Like, I can't really pinpoint to, to say what, you know, what happened, what was wrong. But, you know, look, again, we, we didn't get, intend to go there to lose, but... You know, we, we weren't at our best um, for those three games. The results in the second half of the season saw Leeds slip off the top of League One, and after Leeds lost 3-0 away to Swindon in January, the side slipped into second in the table for the first time since September. And the 13 yep. matches following that Swindon game, Leeds won just three and picked up 14 points out of a possible 39, mm-hmm. seeing the side fall out of the automatic promotion places and into fourth. What do you think was the reasoning for Leeds' dramatic turn in form compared to the first half of the season? Yeah, it, it, it is a hard thing, you know, obviously when when things go against you and, you know, you, you've got no momentum, it's very difficult to sort of get on the, the train again and, and, and start. Um, you know, I, I can't really pick and say, you know, what was the cause, um, but we weren't, we weren't at our best and I, I think we all knew that. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the... The some players that were there in previous years started to think the worst already because of what happened to them 
in the previous years. Um, someone like myself who was new to the club uh, had never felt like that, but obviously he um, didn't like, obviously, where, where the team was going, you know. And with 10 matches of the season remaining, Leeds mm-hmm. lost 2-0 to fellow promotion hopefuls Millwall at Ellen Road. And as well yeah. as losing the match, the side lost you as well for the rest of the season after you yeah. after you ruptured your Achilles tendon during the match. Yeah. Earlier mm-hmm. in the season, it was clear that you were desperate to play for Leeds and to help yeah. the promotion push as much as possible yeah. as you were playing through your head injury. But how did it yeah. feel knowing that you were unable to play the remaining matches of the season? Yeah, look, it, it, it was it was a difficult time that sort of time. Um, I just got a, I just got told, you know, I was in the World Cup squad for South Africa. Um, I was at a club where I love playing and we're pushing for promotion. Um, and then you lose it. <laughs> that all goes away within, you know, I think it was in the first half an hour of the game. Um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't great, uh, to be fair, of that time because, you know, whatever, whatever you had did or have done it before, um, yeah, you, you could only help uh, by moral support. Um, so, yeah, it, it was difficult. It was a difficult time uh, of my sort of football career because there's a lot of things that go through your mind. Am I going to play again? You know, what's going to happen? All this sort of stuff. Um, but I knew I had to sort of, you know, uh, be there for the lads for the remaining 10 games. And like you said, it didn't only end your chances of playing for Leeds, but it also ended your chances of playing in the 2010 World Cup in South Africa for Australia. Yeah. And yeah. you never had the chance to represent Australia again following that injury. How much of a blow was that for you? And what did it feel yeah. like to represent your country? Yeah, look, um, I, I think if you ask any footballer, you know, around the world, you know, what do they want to do? Who do they want to play for? You know, what football? You know, the first thing they would say is, the, you know, their local club or their favourite club, they're like, you know, like Leeds United, if you're born in Yorkshire and play for your country. I think those two there are sort of the top priorities as a young aspiring footballer. Um, and to, play, to represent your country is great, but to get that taken away from you is, you know, very, very difficult. You know, I didn't watch, I don't think I watched the national team game for about four or five years after that because, um, you know, it, it hurt every time sort of you, you try to watch it because you think, geez, you know, I, I should be there or I, or I could be there sort of thing. Um, so it was, it was a difficult time um, of sort of, you know, my football career. And that was sort of behind closed doors. But, you know, as soon as I went to the training ground and, you know, I was in there for treatment that, you know, I knew I couldn't uh, let the lad see, um, you know, my, my hurt or disappointment. I had to be there for them to support them, you know, in the next sort of, 10, you know, most important, you know, games for the club. And despite your absence, which was obviously a huge miss for the side, Leeds played mm-hmm. Bristol Rovers on the final day of the season, knowing that a win yep. would guarantee promotion to the championship after a three-year yep. absence. Mm-hmm. What can you remember about that match and how did it make you feel having to watch the match from the stands? Look, I think that was probably the worst feeling I've ever had, to be honest. Um, you, you can't affect the game. I was in the stands with with my wife and Rich and Ayla, I'll never forget it, and we're watching the game and I was like, geez, I, I can't watch, you know, it was killing me not being out there because you, you can't help, you, you're, you're helpless. Um, and then obviously when Max got sent off, I thought, oh God, here we go. Like, it's it's not great. Um, but then, you know, uh, one of Leeds' favourite sons, you know, Johnny Housen scores from that free kick and I think, you know, and I thought, you know what, this is it, we're, we're going to win it. We're going to win it like this, in this style, it's just meant to be. And then obviously, as you know, Jermaine scores, you know, the the, the last goal to make a 2-1. Um, it was just a sign of relief. Like, you know, for what you set out from the start, even though I was injured, um, I knew that, you know, I'd played a, a, a role that helped the team, you know, sort of achieve what they wanted from day one. Although you missed the last chunk of the season through the Achilles injury, you yeah. voted Leeds as player of the season, which was desired on thoughts from your teammates, as well yeah. as Leeds as fans play over this season. Yeah. How did it feel like to be awarded with an accolades from both your teammates, as well as the Leeds fans, for your performances that season? Yeah, look, to be fair, like, it was a roller coaster of emotions. I, th- I think I wanted to cry on stage when it got um, when it got announced. Um, yeah, it, it, it was great because of, you know, what had happened, you know, uh, through my injury and that. Um, it was great to see that, you know, the, the, at first the fans appreciated sort of 
you know, how I sort of played and um, on the pitch and that I tried to give 100% to every game. Um, and obviously to from the teammates where, you know, like, you know, you, you're there to give them as much confidence, as much uh, trust that you can. And, you know, you just want, you want to achieve the goal with them. Um, so I think I remember saying when I won it that, you know, this award isn't for me, it's for us as a collective because we all worked, you know, really hard to achieve what we did. Um, so it was a, a group award. It wasn't just me that, you know, worked harder. I think it was everyone. So, but look again, it was, it, it was great to receive those accolades. Ten seasons on, you remain the most recent Leeds United centre-back to win the Player of the Season awards. And the most recent winners have been mainly attackers and strikers and have been so before you won it, which shows how much your contribution that season was valued. Yeah. However, as the award is mainly won by attackers, and given the fact that striker Jermaine Beckford finished that season with 31 goals in all competitions, were you yeah. surprised to win it? Um, yeah, look, you know... Again, I think personally for me, I, you know, I, I don't play, I don't play uh, football to win personal awards. You know, I play to achieve, you know, uh, collective awards with the team. Um, so that that's me personally. But look, again, it, it was, uh, it was great. It was it was great just to win one. Again, it could have gone to anyone. Could have gone to Jermaine. Could have gone to Johnny. You know. Um, I was just maybe you know fortunate enough to to receive it from the the fans, even though Jermaine had a, a a fantastic year. And throughout that season, you miss quite a few matches with a couple of different injuries. However, manager Simon Grayson believed that the Achilles injury, which ruled you out of the back end of the season, would leave you sidelined for six months, meaning that yeah. you'd have missed the first half of Leeds' championship season. However, yeah. the injury took a bit longer than expected to heal, and you played just yeah. one match that season and came on as a substitute yeah. on the final day of the season. How yeah. frustrating was it for you to not be able to play in such a successful season? Yeah, look, to be fair, you know, look, I had a, I had a lot of complications with the Achilles. Um, it wasn't healing as planned. Uh, you know, once once it healed, you know, I got an infection. Um, so it was, it was a real nightmare to be honest with you. Um, something that I'll never want to go through again. Uh, but you know, um, the, the the main thing is that at the end of all of it, you know, I did have a chance to get on that pitch again, even if it was that one game, um, and, and play, you know, a certain little time of, um, you know, football. And did you feel that you were fully able to recover from the injury, as you have obviously missed a lot of football because of it? The, 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 I think the, the, the Achilles is probably the worst injury um, due to it's one of the, probably the biggest tendon in your body. Um, you lose a lot of pace through it. Um, so because I had all these complications, you know, you sort of get to teach yourself how to walk again, how to run. Um, you need to build muscle in your, your calves. Uh, you know, all, all this sort of stuff. So it was difficult. It, it was a difficult time to get back to what I knew what I was and how could I perform at the way I am. That was the difficult bit because the way I was uh, before the way I returned was not the same player that I am because um, it, it took me at least a year and a bit to get sort of to half to where I was, you know, when I came back to Australia. Um, so it was... It was a difficult. It was a difficult thing, and and I knew and I knew that in my head, you know. I just, you know, I just had to find a way that um, I could teach myself, sort of, to get back to, you know, wh where I could be. Although your second season at Leeds was more or less ruled out, apart from that one match, yeah. when you did sign for the club, you signed on a two-year deal. So yeah. after that second season, your contract was set to expire, and the club hadn't offered you a new deal because of your injury despite yeah. having such, such a successful first year. Yeah. Were you surprised that the club didn't offer you a new contract despite your injury to ensure look, that you could play when you had recovered? Look, I, I think I think nowadays, you know, it's, and, and you look back, you know, it, it's difficult for the club to sort of, you know, um, re-sign a player that had made an injury. You know, in the day, as we all know, you know, footballers look, looked at like assets. Um, so, why would they sign someone like myself again if maybe they knew that maybe they couldn't get the best out of me or the injury was just too much? 
Um, so I, I sort of understand that now. Um, at the time, you know, you, you, you don't because, you know, you, you want to be part of the club um, and you want to get back to playing football. So as much as I can, as much as it hurt, I sort of can see, you know, where they come from. And, you know, again, especially at a club where, you know, it's still probably the best club that I've ever played at. Um, you, you, you didn't want to leave because you wanted to, you know, you wanted to play for the fans again. You wanted to play for the top. Um, you wanted to succeed with a club that, you know, you loved. And there's not, there's not many footballers that, that can say that. At the start of the 2011-12 season, you'd begun training, which prompted Leeds to offer you a short-term deal with yeah. the promise that they would offer you a longer deal once you return to full fitness. Yeah. However, during that period, it was reported that a number of other sides were interested in signing you before Leeds offered you a full-time deal. Were yeah. you ever close to leaving Leeds at that time? To be fair, no, because, you know, you know, I wanted to stick through Leeds the way they stuck through me. So um, even though it was, it was nice that I had you know, other people after me, um, I wanted to repay, repay back Leeds um, for what they did to help me recover. Despite other interest, you signed a new deal, which was another two-year contract. And in yeah. the interview which you had when you signed, you stated that you had unfinished business at Leeds after having such a long time off. What yeah. did you mean by that? Look, I, I, I think, you know, I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to, you know, get, get to the premiership of the club um, because, uh, you know, again, I, I missed a, a lot of football in the championship. And, and I thought out of all years, that was sort of, one of the main years that sort of the close to you, we could come, you know, to, to at least get promoted. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to get promoted, you know, with the club, you know, because I knew um, how, you know, how big and how great the club is. At the beginning of that season, despite having a fairly successful previous campaign and finishing just outside the playoffs in your first season back in the championship, Leeds decided to cash in on a lot of their players selling the likes of Kasper Schmeichel to Leicester City for just one million yeah. and allowing yeah. both Johnny Housen and Bradley Johnson to move to Norwich yeah. and selling Max Gradle to St Etienne for less than £2 million. How frustrating yeah. was that for you as a player as Leeds were selling some of the best players as they have done in previous years with Jermaine Betford, etc. and not really reinvesting the money back into the squad? Yeah, look, I, I was near one off the gaff at that time. That was just a season before. Right, uh, look, yeah, it's... A, a, a difficult one, you know, maybe it, it, it's a hard one to tell because, you know, for for probably the amount that, you know, I think Brad came on a free, Johnny Housen was a free, Max Grader was a free to make some money. I think that's a bonus for the club. Um, but in hindsight, you know, they're the players sort of that you need to keep, you know, to get promoted with, to create a, a, a squad that is, you know, that can play in the prem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, th that's the thing. You need you need stability. Uh, if you look at all the clubs now that get promoted, they've been together three years. You know, look at Leicester City. You know, they 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 got they didn't get promoted until you know it took them two three years. You know, same. I think that maybe Leeds should have done. They should have kept sort of their best players, built a squad around them, um, and then really keep challenging. You know, to get promoted because they would have, and once they did, okay, then then obviously you know the equation changes. But they decided not to, um, and then you know it's difficult because then you're trying to replace th those players, which is very hard to find. Did you think that this selling technique damaged Lee's chance of achieving a high table finish in the championship, as these players, which have previously done so well for Leeds, were being replaced by mainly free signings, and the squad was changing massively every single season with a large amount of players leaving the club and then similarly yeah. a large amount of players joining the club as well. Yeah, and and that's the thing. Again, I think a successful team and club, they need to establish players that have been there for, you know, for a few years. Um, when you get constant changes, it's very difficult uh, to assemble a squad that have been together for, you know, a pre-season to actually win and sustain high results. Um, and, and again, it's it, it's frustrating because, you know, we, if I look at when we were in League One, you know, we had a group of plays that started there and, you know, achieved what they did within, you know, a couple of years. And I thought maybe 
you know, maybe a one or two or three, maybe extra signings, but still keeping the main core of the group, I think it would have been different. Um, but obviously, you know, Leeds didn't want to go that way or maybe the, the manager didn't want to at that time. So it was, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because you know, I think what could be achieved with, you know, if you kept the core group of players. Leeds lost their first two matches in the championship that season. And in the third game, you were handed the captain's armband for the match against Hull City at Ellen Road, a match yeah. which Leeds won 4-1. Yeah. What was it like captaining the side? And did you have to change anything as a player? Look, I think, look, to, to captain, to, to go what I've gone through and to captain the, the, the team, obviously, was, was, was a massive honour. Um, it was, you know, a, a great feeling. Um, and to get the result on the night was even better. Uh, but I, I you, you do got to change, you know, you got to get used to, especially myself coming back from a, you know, a big, big injury. You, you got to sort of change the way you play a bit. Um, you, you got to sort of be, be a bit smarter, um, where before, you know, I didn't need to think because, you know, I had that acceleration, I had that pace, um, where this time, because I was still trying to get back at my maximum, sometimes it's difficult to, you know, to to keep going like that. So I had to be a bit smarter in in the way I played, um, and it wasn't it wasn't something that I was sort of used to. But I had to sort of train myself to to be like that. As Leeds were flirting with the playoff places in January, you received another injury, which would rule you out for the remainder of the season. Yeah. Prior to that, you'd fe featured in almost every championship match after yeah. overcoming your previous injury. So, yeah. what was it like to receive another setback? Yeah, I think I did. I think I, think I did my ACL. Um, yeah, it, it was gut gut wrenching because um, you do all this work um, and you miss out on a lot to get back to where you know you think you're okay, and then another setback happens. Um, it's very difficult mentally uh, because you think, "Oh, it's yourself, Jesus Christ, here we go again." Even though you know the ACL is not as bad as the Achilles. You know, it's still a you know, it's still a six month injury at, at least. You know, so I knew I'd missed the rest of the season, um, and then you know, try and be ready for the, the preseason. You know, and and it's hard because I didn't want to get labelled. You know, oh, he's always injured because I'd never been injured before that. You know, I've never picked up soft tissue injuries. Um, <laughs> I've just cop, you know, two of the worst ones there is. So it was a difficult pill to swallow. But you know, you realise, you know, what can you do? During your time off the pitch, in February, Leeds sacked manager Simon Grayson after the side fell to 10th in the Championship. Yeah. Owner Ken Bates stated that he wanted a Leeds manager who could get Mao out of the squad, which he was frequently changing and he mm -hmm. was selling all of, all of the players like we previously mentioned. Right. Do you think it was the right time for Grayson to leave Leeds and do you think that was a fair comment from Ken Bates? Look, I think, I think it's hard because, you know... I'm a I'm a I'm a football manager now. Do you want to sell your best players? No. So you know whose choice was it to sell them? Number one, I, I don't know. You know, um, so that was a difficult one. I, I think I, I think the I, I think the gaffer was the right man for the job, um, but it's, it's it was a difficult situation. Maybe he was in trying to find the perfect mix to get him the results he needed um, due to the you know, the, the players that he was trying to replace um, where previously he, he knew those players already. So it, it's a difficult one. And, you know, only managers can sort of answer that question. Um, but I assume that, you know, I'd, I'd like to know, you know, if it was really Simon Grayson, Grayson's choice to sell the players, because if it was, if it was me, you know, why would you sell, you know, your best players where you, you, know, you have a chance to get promoted again. How did you find Simon Grayson as a manager? Yeah, look, I, I thought it was great. Um, you know, him, myself, and I, myself and I, him and me had a a great, you know, honest relationship. Um, you know, I could turn to him for anything. You know, um, he, he was great. He, you know, he taught me a few tricks in terms of defending, and you, know, you, you learned to off him. You know, he was you could he was very approachable. Um, so he he was great to me. Um, so, you know, I, I really enjoyed working with him. Neil Warnock was appointed by Ken Bates later that season. Yeah. How yeah. did his managerial style differ from Simon Grayson's? 
how long have you got? Because man, I could I could go for twelve hours here. <laughs> um, I, I think it was the wrong choice because of knowing Leeds in the way they are. Um, you know, Simon Grayson was hands on, and you know, I don't think Neil Warnock was. Uh, you know, it was it was it was very different to you know what I was used to. You know. Neil, uh, Tom Grayson was very, you know, structured. We knew we had a plan. You know, Neil Warnock wasn't really. Um, so it, it was, it was, it was difficult to to get used to. You know, um, and to be fair, I didn't really enjoy my time when you know he was the manager because not because he was a, a, a bad guy. You know, he he wasn't, but I think his coaching style. Um, yeah, it wasn't wasn't the right one for me. And and if you see, he's had a great career in getting teams promoted. And you know, people, a lot of people say otherwise. But for me, um, he wasn't he, he wasn't the coach that was you know that was right for me and the way I wanted maybe the club to go and the way I wanted the team to play. Yeah, and despite returning to full fitness at the start of the 2012 yeah. 2013 season, when Warnock yeah. was in charge, you never played a league game under him. Do you have any idea why that was? Well, to be fair, he, he, it, it was crazy because, um, you know, we spoke, we, we probably spoke, I think our, our first game was the Wolves game in the, in, the, in the championship. And I think it was two days before and you know, he was saying, listen, you're going to start, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I ended up didn't, I didn't start and he put me on the bench. So it was it was weird because he was telling me things that weren't happening. So obviously as a footballer, you know, your, your trust goes out the window. Um, so, you know, in, in the day I was, I was there, you know, for the players and, and all that. Um, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I felt that I wasn't there. Okay. And, you know, when you get to, when you have to play under 23 games, um, and not for because I'm, um, you know, I was older than that. But when you have to play under twenty three games, and you know, you ask why, and you know, is there any reason for it? I don't think there was. So it was disappointing that you know the relationship between myself and the club, and not meaning the club in as a whole, but I think the coaching staff at that time, what yeah, wasn't going the right path. And because of your lack of playing time, at the end of the season, it was announced that your contract would not be extended and that you, you would be leaving the yep. club after four years. How did that yep. make you feel? Yeah, look, it, it, it was a difficult one to swallow because, um, because again, you know, there was, there was someone that came to the club at a, at a time where obviously that I was injured, but I, I came full fit and... and didn't fulfill what he was telling the player. So again, you felt they had unfinished business because, you know, you, you weren't playing. And if you look at that squad now, uh, that was there at the time, you know, they, they, they were in and they came out. They weren't there for long term. You know, they weren't long term players that you can think, okay, you know, this team's going to get promoted with this, with these players. You know, I think he changed the squad completely if I'm not correct, if I'm correct or not. But I think he completely, you know, changed the, all the players. Um, and, you know, I, I think Leeds, you know, the people that know, Leeds is a special club. Um, it's a special club. It's a sp There's special fans that you need to play for. Um, and if you don't have that in you, I think it's, it's, I think it's very hard to, to, to sort of succeed at that club. Very difficult. Um, and I don't, and I think that, with the group that he brought in, I don't think it was the answer to the sort of to the club, where the club wanted to go. Hence, why obviously I think he got sacked in the end. Given your injury problems at Leeds and how you were thirty-two at the time, do you yeah. think that it was the right time for you to move on, or did you feel that you had something more to give at Leeds? Yeah, look, I think I, I think I had uh, plenty more. If I didn't, what, what you know, obviously my age was you know older um but you know i i think my experience at leeds could have taught the maybe players that are in this that were in the team that you know like and i'm sure this would have happened you know when you know the the, the lead sides of 
you know, the, the Champions Leagues and Don Revies that, you know, you got to have leads in you and that's it. You know, I think that's the, 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 the part that people don't get. It's just not, Leeds is just not a normal club. It's not a normal club. Um, and it would have been great to stay around to really educate the players and say, okay, listen, you're here, but you need to understand, you know, what, what it means to play for this club. It's not just going out on a Saturday or Tuesday and, you know, to play 90 minutes. It's more than that. It's life here. Um, and that's what I wish I could have stuck around to really instill that sort of culture within the club. Since your departure, have you ever visited Edel Road since? I, I did. I, I went last year. Which yeah. Um, yeah, I, I took I took the family. We went to Europe. Um and yeah, it was emotional. To be fair, uh, I went for uh, I went for Robert Snodgrass's wedding in Scotland, um, and uh, went to see him for a couple of days and spent some time with Bradley Johnson. Um, then met up with Johnny Halson. It was like a like a Leeds reunion. Met up with Johnny Halson um, uh, in in Leeds City Centre. Um, then I took my my two daughters. One was born in in Harrogate. We, I took them to. Um, obviously Allen Road and yeah, like the memories, the memories that like came in my mind as soon as I went to the club, it, it brought tears to me because, you know, it, it, it was such a, a fantastic place to play and to be at that time. This second section of the show is sponsored by the Harrogate CBD Company. Harrogate CBD Company are a local business run by Leeds United fans and they're on a mission to help people sleep better and relax during lockdown. They source the finest CBD products so you don't have to look any further when looking for anxiety relief or a helping hand when struggling to sleep. Research has shown that CBD can help refresh your mindset and increase your focus to reduce anxiety and their oils contain pure hemp, organic ingredients and less than 0.2% THC content. If you want to find out more about their products, visit them on www.hgcbd.co.uk or on Instagram at Harrogate underscore CBD and add the discount code LUFC to receive 5% off all their oils and sprays. They've also begun shipping their products worldwide as well as the UK and can now offer delivery to 72 different countries. So go and check them out. In this section, our followers get to ask their questions to our guests by commenting on our LUFC fan zone Instagram post. Each episode, we select four questions which are commented on our post and put them forward to our guest. Today's first question comes from Owen, who asks, Who was the best player you played with during your time at Leeds? Uh, it, 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 it's a hard one, because um, there were so many great players. Um, but I think... You know, I think everyone would say, you know, Jermaine Beckford and stuff like that. Um, but for me, you know, I would say this too. Uh, one of them would be Johnny Housen. Um, He's a Leeds boy um, and he really showed me, you know, what Leeds was all about and what it meant to everyone and especially him, um, what it meant to play for his boyhood club and captain it. Um, and probably Max Gradle. Um, I knew Max from Leicester, but, you know, as we know, every time he, he came on that pitch, he changed the game. Um, and he, he, he was brilliant. He was exciting. Um, and again, I, I thought he was fantastic. The next question comes from Alex, who asks, Hi, Paddy. What was your favourite moment in the Leeds United shirt? Yeah. Oh, we'll say Man United, right? Um, it, it was... It was a day that we'd never forgotten. Um, it, it, was, it was similar to, you know, uh, going into, you know, uh, the gladiator and knowing that everyone wants, everyone wants you to be killed. But you, you actually killed the gladiator. It was brilliant. And especially with 10,000 uh, Leeds fans, um, sounding like there were 100,000 Leeds fans, uh, it was a day that would never be forgotten. Thirdly, Johnny asks... Guys, hi Paddy. So my question for you is, if you could relive the emotions that you had from either the win against Manchester United, which you obviously played in, or the promotion winning game against Bristol Rovers, which you didn't play in, which game would you choose? Ah, uh, look, I, look I, I, in, in a selfish sense, I would pick Man United because of uh, 
you know, because I contributed to the game because I played. Um, but if you look at, you know, where Leeds is now, um, it's got to be, it's, it has to be the promotion because it was the pathway to probably where hopefully Leeds will go in the end and that's going to be to the premiership. Finally, Gaz asks. Hi, guys. Hi, Patrick. My question is, do you have any regrets from your time at Leeds? Um, I actually don't. Uh, you know, I, I just wish that, you know, that I, I, I could have stayed longer um, because, again, the, the relationship I had with that club and everyone involved in that club was, you know, immense. And I still speak to them to this day. Um, maybe one regret would have been telling uh, a, a certain manager what I actually really thought. But I didn't. Um, but that would probably be my only regret. But yeah, again, look, I, I can't really complain about you know what my time at Leeds. Not Mr. Warnock by any chance. It, it is, you know, and and the, the hard thing is, is that again, you know, like for for me, for me, you know, was it the manager at that right time that could really get to our what our club needed to get to, you know? Um, that was that thing, and and that's why I keep re- reiterating. You know, there's a special, it's a there's a special player, and if you look at all the best clubs in the world, all the best teams in the world, to play at like we'll say say Barcelona, you have got to be a special type of player. Um, there's no there's no thing of same with Leeds. You got to be a special type of player, but also you need a special type of manager to coach that club. Um, that's what makes these clubs so great. Because they're not just your normal Joe Blows, they've got to be they've got to be a special type. Um, so yeah. And that ends today's episode. Thank you to everyone for sending their questions, and thank you so much for your time, Patrick. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate it. We'll be back in two weeks with our next guest. But who will you choose? Stay tuned for our upcoming vote on our LUFC fans' own Instagram story later this week. Thank you for listening. <laughs>